Marvel is rewriting the God War and the God Killer, and I'm excited to see where this leads. So, what this does is this picks up with Thor going to see his mother Gaia, who's an elder goddess. Because as the reader, we didn't fully know what was going on. All we knew was that there was Utgard Thor and Utgard Loki, and somehow they were tied into Thor's mother, and that was it, right? We didn't have any information. This answers it all. And so what happens is when he shows up here, he basically summons her. Now, Gaia, as she appears here, does not appear as she historically has in Marvel Comics, which is to say a very attractive woman who looks gorgeous in terms of like a goddess, things like that. She kind of looks like a Swamp Thing type character. She's pretty haggard in the here and now. And one could argue that this to a degree is her actual form, but we're even told that, right? Like, twas natural to hesitate. Thor was God of thunder, a God of the sky, of the clean air. Such a being is is not at home when asked to voyage deeper and deeper into the earth. Yet the truth he sought was not found above. So he pressed on as the passage wound deeper, the rock narrower until he reached the end of the journey and beheld Gaia. Yet this was not the Gaia he knew. And so just the physical form is starkly different. She kind of appears to be corrupted. And what he does here is in a lot of ways kind of recap what had already happened, right? That Utgard Thor, also known as Tyrannos, had basically shown up talking about how he was an elder god of thunder that existed long before Thor. The two of them fought, Thor almost lost. He had to basically assemble his own core, right? So like Storm and Loki and these various characters all brought together in order to defeat Tyrannos and more or less they won. They kind of cast him into another dimension and that was it. But all this stemmed from the fact that he was set free by Gaia. So when he shows up here, it's like, why are you doing Doing this. Now this is where the God Killer and the God War comes into play because when Thor says like give me an answer she responds with a fair question and I will answer but first I have a question of my own tell me small God who are you who are you to know my reasons right and what the response of Thor is I am the champion of Midgard the realm you've endangered I am the avenger of those you have wronged I am your child, because that's true. Thor is the biological child of Gaia and Odin. Now there was a time where Marvel tinkered with the idea that Thor was the biological child of Phoenix and Odin. Honestly, I thought that was pretty cool. That was during Jason Aaron's Avengers run because truly Thor being the son of Gaia doesn't really matter. It has no real bearing on anything that he really does day in and day out. So it's doesn't matter if it changes or not. So I thought it was kind of cool, right, that Marvel did that. But at the end of the day, her response is, well, I have many children, right? And you are the least among them. And she says, mighty Avenger, champion of the earth, where were you when the earth was formed? When the Demiurge cast his gaze upon the dark of the deep and brought forth Titans, Tyrannos was there. Cthone was there, Set and Tiwaz were there. He who you call Utgard Loki, he whose name we cannot speak, he was there. And I was there as the ancient gods made war, for I was there to win that war. Now, one thing that I want to specify here, and this is kind of a big change, Tiwaz or Tiwaz or however it is you want to pronounce it, that's a big change. And in fact, that directly affects the Asgardians. The reason why is because Tiwaz is basically Buri, right? The grandfather of Odin. The idea behind this in Marvel Comics is that even going back to the days of like Jack Kirby's, you know, backup stories and Journey into Mystery, where he basically told the history of Asgard in Marvel Comics, by and large, Asgard was just a dimension that existed out there and somehow came into existence and has just been there ever since. And the origin was tied into, for the most part, traditional mythology here in the real world when it came to Asgard. In order to bring it more in line with Marvel Comics and given an origin that somehow ties into Earth. Even back in like 1985, I think it was, right? Like Buri was given the name Tiwaz and then his origin was tied into the Elder Gods. What this does here is continue that and then solidify it. So the way this works is a Gaia tells us the Elders battled endlessly, monstrosities of myth, enemies by their nature, each seeking to claim whatever their kinfolk possessed caring not for the ground under their feet, the good earth they sacrificed thoughtlessly to maintain a world of constant strife, caring not for the life that struggled to be born upon it. Not even my hardiest creation survived the stagnant churn 
of the God war, yet I am life, and I would seed and spread and propagate. Created, I would create and nurture creation. And in this, I alone of all here have common cause with thee, O Demiurge, unknowable one who planted the seeds of gods in the earth. I am the earth, and I am ready for the new seed. For I have a vision of life that springs and changes and grows from life, not from the decrees of almighty powers. Now, here's one of the important things to grasp here, right? This is all kind of told as a flashback, right? These gods waging war against each other and the idea of Gaia talking to Demiurge. The reason why is because in Marvel Comics, those of you guys who are unfamiliar, you do have your traditional gods, Sky Fathers, right? So like Odin and Vishnu and those various uh, godheads from like traditional religions that exist around the world. Now, before all of that were the Elder Gods and the powers of the Elder Gods were extreme. I mean, these guys were next level. Most of you guys have heard of Cthone, right? Like the guy who channels chaos magic and that Scarlet Witch channels that power, right? So, I mean, he is ridiculously overpowered. Guys like Ashtur would go on to become part of the Vishanti, the people that Doctor Strange gets his powers from, or at least something like 80% of his powers from. The Elder Gods were incredibly powerful, but they were all born from Demiurge. And so in the early days, and what's not really explained here per se, is that with the creation of the Elder Gods, for a time, they just kind of existed on Earth. But one of them ended up making a move, and it was actually started by either Set or Cthone, one of those two, I believe. They made the move of attacking another and then consuming them and their power. And that's what kicked off this whole war in the first place. And so what Guy is talking about here is that as the kind of essence of Earth itself, right, Mother Nature, if you want to call it that, when she talks about the idea of dreaming of a life, right, where life can propagate and grow, She's talking about humanity for the most part, right? Plants, animals, all that kind of stuff. Basically the nature of earth itself absent the elder gods. And so this is where you get into the idea of the God killer, because one of the things that she describes, she says, first among sky fathers, cold gaze that brought us forth and doomed the world to us. Bestow upon me thy power of creation that I might gift this world with progeny immaculate and save it. For there are things of which I will not speak for they cannot be contained in the words. For whenever life comes together to make new life, that is merely the play of shadows. And this was the light. The Demiurge did as he was bid. The new seed was planted. And so as most of you guys who are familiar with these older stories are kind of putting together, this is where a tomb comes from, right? A new seed of a new God who created himself in me. I held the light like an ember until I found my way to the deep places, perhaps to this very place. And there did I give birth, Thor, to thy eldest brother. A tomb was his name, first of the gods, and the first of the gods that was a man of fire. The son he was, and God of the sun. What this guy literally did here is he showed up on earth and eradicated every single one or nearly every single one of the elder gods. That's how powerful a tomb was. Guys like Cthone, despite how powerful they are against heroes in the modern day, which make no mistake, Cthone is more than enough. If this guy showed up on earth in his legitimate form, right, at the height of his power, he would take all comers and dominate pretty much every superhero on Earth. You'd have to rely on like the Infinity Gauntlet, right? Or a Cosmic Cube to save you from the wrath and the power of that guy. When a tomb shows up, none of that matters, right? This guy's level of power is so extreme. Guys like Cthone and Set, they flee to other dimensions because they can't defeat this guy. He just eradicates everybody, right? And that's what we're told. And he burned away all that was not needed on the Earth. The Elder Gods, first of all, those ancient ones shrieked curses as he tore them from existence, taking all essence of them into himself, lest any scrap remained to be reborn. And in doing, he showed his other face, the shifting face that turns upon the world when a tomb turns away, the night side when the sun has set, the empty shell that howls through many mouths, 
the Demo Gorge. Now, I wanna give you guys perspective here, right? In Mighty Thor, which I think was volume two, back in 2011, right? The Shattered Heroes story arc, Thor fought Demogorge, right? He actually ended up beyond all space and time. And that was basically a place where all the gods who quote unquote died, went to and they were all consumed by Demogorge, right? That's how powerful this guy was. Thor was able to defeat Demogorge by striking his heart with his hammer and then managed to escape, but he almost died in the process. Thor escaped by the skin of his teeth. Here's the funny thing. As he's talking to Gaia, he says this. He says, I, I faced your first son many times. And her response, you faced the Demogorge. You have never fought a tomb. Heed my words, Thor do not. And that's a fair warning here, because if Thor goes to fight a tomb, a tomb is going to demolish him, right? I mean, just, it wouldn't even be close. If they maintain this level of power consistently into the story, Thor would fall with the greatest of ease. There's no conceivable way, even with the all power, right? Like even as Thor, the all father, right? The Thor force or the Odin force or whatever you want to call it these days, no way he would go toe to toe against a tomb, right? It's just never going to happen. And so the response of Thor, if you say so, mother, the elder gods survived him. And she says a scant few. Cthone and Set created nether planes to escape to. Ashtor and Tiwaz wandered, siring their own children, right? Again, Tiwaz basically gave birth to Bor, who gave birth to Odin and Vili and V and so on and so forth, right? The Asgardians, in essence, right? And it's one of these things where Marvel kind of toys with the idea of a half-life. And it's actually one of the things they solidified in relatively recent years. I want to say it was back during 2008 when Thor actually fought Bor. And it was one of these things where like, Buri had a level of strength, right? And following the half-life idea that Bor is half as strong as Buri, that Odin is half as strong as Bor, meaning he's 25% as strong as Buri. And it just keeps going on and on and on, meaning that Thor is nowhere near as powerful as his grandfather was. And there's no way Thor is going to be able to defeat a tomb because his grandfather couldn't defeat a tomb, right? Like, what chance does he have? That's really the philosophy being put here, right? And so in return, Gaia says, and then there was the one who cannot be named. And so in this kind of flashback conversation with what's basically Utgard Loki, by all standards of measurement, right? And she says, you also form your own domain, unnameable one. And he says, my outland, yes, far from your monstrous son and his monstrous gullet. Again, speaking about a tomb. And she says, Tiwa sent his servant with a rumor in its beak that Tyrannos will travel with you. This was basically the creation of like, Utgard, right? This realm where these kind of ancient versions of Thunder Gods and the original God of Tricksters, right? Utgard, Loki, all these guys, these just supremely powerful Elder God uh, ancestors, really, to like Thor and all those guys, this is where they all went to. And the response of Utgard Loki is, don't say you're surprised, sister. There's common ground in being hunted by a ravenous god killer. And why just one to a plane? There's strength in numbers. And then he goes on to list what are essentially other elder gods who are there. So what you guys may be picking up here, and it is a little confusing in terms of the conversation, Thor is the god of thunder in the sense that he's just the god of thunder, right? I mean, Marvel borrows that from, you know, real world Norse mythology and so on and so forth. Within Marvel Comics, what they're establishing here is there have been gods of thunder before Thor. He's hardly the first person to be able to control the weather. I mean, Storm and the X-Men can do that, right? He has the name and the title, but there were elder gods who command the same kind of power that he did, but on much grander levels. What you're seeing here in this conversation between Gaia and Utgard Loki, right? This just exceedingly old elder god who was one of the first original gods of tricksters, right? This god of deception and that kind of a thing. That what he did that they all basically banded together. And it's kind of a way to make their own version of Asgard, so to speak. Asgard didn't exist at this point in time, but it's kind of like their own Asgard, right? Their own realm, right? That sort of thing. So it's kind of borrowing on the idea, Thor, Loki, these kind of being titles, right? Names that are just used or have been used by various people over the years. And so that's why he says, we may build a temple out there, a pantheon, create our own kingdom of gods, a great hall out in the Utgard. Now the gate is built, and for you, sister, the key, in case you ever wish to unlock it. So this door could only be opened by Gaia, which she did. And that's what Thor says. And after millennia, you did open it. You unsealed the gate 
Utgard Loki built, the gate that lies in all realms and no realm. Why, mother, you said you would answer. And he asks, what reason could you possibly have for turning on your own children? And she says, ask the dinosaurs, ask Los Ashim, which I allowed thy father to raise. The earth is not always kind. And the argument that she creates here is that I, as Gaia, am a living sentient being. And I'm literally just being killed off. So if humanity won't fix the error of its ways, I will kill them all. And so the response of Thor is no, right? He swears to protect it. Now, here's the irony of this, right? He says, this is not a justice, right? Like what you're doing here, eradicating the whole of humanity because of how they're essentially treating you, that's not going to work, right? They deserve mercy. And she responds in saying, what do you think you were? Right? As my son, you were the mercy I sent to earth. You were the mercy that I presented to humanity to show them a better way. If humanity could change, it would have changed. Humanity has chosen not to. Whether they see themselves as a collective group or as a series of individualistic countries is irrelevant. The fact is, they are a singular race, and by virtue of their actions, they show that as a singular race, they will not change. Therefore, I will eradicate this singular race. I will restart the God War. I will cleanse life from this planet and start anew. And so that's where Thor swears no, right? He says, if this is going to happen, they deserve a shot, right? They deserve a shot to essentially correct themselves. So what you end up doing is having Thor transitioning to rocks on oil. <laughs> And this is how you find out it's basically an environmentalist story, right? It's really all it is. Because Roxxon Oil is just like this ultra-corrupt corporation in the world, right? Any criminal activity that a company could be engaged in, Roxxon is engaged in, right? It's like if uh, Amazon and Facebook were combined into like one company. And that's basically it, yeah, right? Just corruption on a hitherto unrivaled scale. And so Thor shows up here to speak with Dario Agger, right? The Minotaur, the guy who runs Roxxon. And where he's told like, you know, Dario does not meet with anybody unless they have an appointment. The response of Thor is he will meet with me, right? Like he will meet with me because literally the fate of the world depends on this guy's actions. What I'm curious to see is if Thor's going to kill him right? I'm curious to see what happens. But the funny thing is Marvel's basically relaunching Thor with a new number one, and I don't fully understand why, right? That's the biggest issue Marvel has. Say, so, hey guys, here's a story that's amazing. Don't you love it? Yes, Marvel, I absolutely love it. Cool. We're kicking off the writer and the artist and we're starting over again. Like, okay, cool, Marvel. Thanks for destroying my interest in the comic book. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end <laughs> and I will catch you all later. Peace.